Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome listeners to Passage to Profit, the inventor show. Well, my normal co-host Richard couldn't make it today, so I have enlisted the wonderful Coach Kenya, Kenya Gibson from iHeartRadio to stand in for Richard today. Hey, Kenya. Hi, how are you? I'm so honored to be here today, standing in for Richard. It's a treat. And that has made it an all-women show today, which I think this is the first time that's happened, but I think we can easily carry that off with all these yeah. super intelligent, successful women, right? Definitely. Yeah, so speaking of super intelligent, successful women, our guest today is going to be Dahlia McPhee. And I'm not going to say too much about her because I like to let people talk about themselves and you can find out that way. And then our executive spotlight is Gabriella Centinello. Stay tuned because you'll be able to hear what she has to say about herself in her own words. And then Effie Panagopoulos and then Stacey Kirk. And Kenya and I will be interviewing them and asking them questions. Oh, and Kenya and I are going to have our little segment in there. Kenya's is power move. Mine is I talk about my business fireside. So it ought to be a very interesting show. It's got a little bit of a fashion twist with a little bit of something extra too. So stay tuned. And if for some reason you have to go park, you're listening to this in your car or whatever, the podcast comes out tomorrow. You can also find us on the YouTube channel. If you want to see this amazing lineup of gorgeous women, I mean... (laughs) It's pretty cool today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dahlia McPhee, a serial entrepreneur, a success in the fashion world. Dahlia, tell us how you're doing it all. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I started a fashion brand several years ago. Always had a love of fashion, came from an entrepreneurial family. I I had a dream to get into the fashion world. So I created a small brand of eight dresses and I took off to a trade show in Atlanta. Long story short, uh, within a year, my brand could be found in several thousand stores and most major department stores. Like many people in the business world, I've ridden the roller coaster up and down and up and down. We're still in uh, several major department stores. And over the years, I started trying to renegade some parts of the apparel industry. So we were one of the first mainstream fashion brands to go all vegan. We were also one of the first mainstream fashion brands to offer a full size range in all of our designs. And over the years, I've just kept morphing and growing. So the past several years, I started merging tech with fashion and we started creating some very cool things with that. We have some cool products, which I'll tell you about that are going forward. And then as of late, when uh, COVID hit, We, like many businesses, had to take a breather and do a pivot. So we did a pivot in March and went from evening gowns and evening dresses to hospital gowns. And uh, so we've been manufacturing for a few of the major hospital chains across the country and then also started doing some innovation. So uh, we invented uh, and released a wallet called the antiviral wallet. That's a pretty interesting solution. Wallets are disgusting. I think about like where we leave them in general and then now we have COVID going on. Well, what happened was COVID hit. And then obviously when we started working with some of the hospitals, I started asking what they needed. And I kept hearing at that moment as everybody in the world heard, there's a shortage of masks. It's one thing to hear it. It's another when you feel you're a part of it. Speaking to nurses that are crying, saying, I'm going into the COVID ward and I'm literally taking the same mask and using it all day long. And I'm being told to use it all week. And they're supposed to actually change it each time they go in and out. So I kind of got to work and thought, what is it that we can do to disinfect these masks? Not just for the healthcare workers, but also for all of us that are using cloth masks or the KN95 versions. So basically what this is, and you can see it on our website or also antiviralwallet.com. Looks like a wallet that you would put your credit cards in, except instead of putting your credit cards in it, you put two masks, one on each side, and it's thermal lined. So you zip it up, you plug it in the wall, and it heats up the contents inside the wallet to 180 degrees for 30 minutes, killing most bacteria and viruses. It's been tested. We had COVID tested on it, uh, E. coli, and it was incredibly successful. And it also, it's kind of like having clean laundry coming out. So if you've ever reused a KN95 mask or even some of the cloth masks, if you you know are lucky enough to be traveling, 
smelling right now. There's odors. You can't get to a washing machine. It's also getting rid of all of that. So that's one of the products. Excellent. So how are you doing with selling it? Are you using the same channels you used for your fashion? Are you using different channels to sell this? We produced for a couple of private clients in the healthcare world. We're in discussion actually with a few larger companies going forward. We made it available to the public. It sold out within a couple days. So we're doing a new production run and, uh, you know, we're making calls to some of the bigger chains. I think that this is here for a while and I'm a hundred percent for safety tech and fashion. I love seeing where is there a problem that we can potentially solve, do it quickly, make it fashionable, make it easy and make it affordable. For our consumer products listeners, people, inventors of consumer products, how do you sell out in a couple of days? How do you know, how do you let enough people know about it that you sell out in a couple of days? Because that's the hardest part. People could have wonderful inventions. How do you get the word out there? Great question. <laughs> you know, I think we're all still trying to figure that out a little bit. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways, obviously, to generate sales. In this particular case, it was the right thing at the right time. This one was more organic. I didn't even want to take the time because of the urgency. But, you know, it's a combo. And, and I don't know if any of us have quite gotten the formula yet. It's, a you know, between the Google ads, Facebook ads, social media influencers, we have a large celeb following, which always helps. You know, I'm still learning that online world myself a bit because for years, our business model was always direct to the retailers and the retailers handled it. And obviously being an entrepreneur and in this ever-changing world, we have to keep stepping up and keep growing. You know, we also did a fanny pack for a bunch of the health frontline workers because they needed packs to put their PPE in, say the masks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so as we were creating it for one of our accounts, I'd said, so the frontline workers are putting their phones in these things too, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes. And I said, so they have their phone in a fanny pack up against their person for eight hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do. So I decided to uh, line it with a Faraday type material that cuts out radiation by 80%. Oh, wow. You'll get a call coming in, but if you were to hold an EMF reader, there's very little radiation coming through there. You don't want radiation up against your reproductive organs all day. You no, know, I mean, this is one of those things where then you start going, well, we could be putting this in all our pockets and maybe we should be changing the codes in the apparel world where any pocket that would be, or maybe it would be labeled as the cell phone pocket. And so you would know that that would be the safe pocket. To me, I, I try to think in terms of reality. 80% safer is better than nothing. Right. So you've come up with so many good ideas. It's just amazing. And you and I were talking about testing ideas. So in the United States, you have a year before you have to file your patent application if you make something public. So you can test whatever you're creating for a year in the U.S. before you file your patent application. Not so in other countries. So if you want to see if it's going to sell and you just want to sell it in the U.S., you can do the whole nine yards and then file a year after your first public disclosure. But in Europe, you have to file immediately before you publicly disclose. But you were saying that you do use that as a strategy because you have so many ideas. Some things you won't patent right away. You want to see how they do, right? Well, for sure. And this is a slightly newer avenue for me. I started owning the apparel business and with things being a more traditional route in the earlier years, I kind of put it on the back burner. And then, but I always had the bug. I came out with the first light up premium denim jeans in the world back in 2001. But I put a bunch on the back burner. And then it was the past couple years, I started with the Equisafe fire retardant blanket with the GPS built in. And then after that, I got the bug and said, okay, what else? And so I started learning about patents. It was as an entrepreneur kind of starting from scratch and going, whoa, whole new world. How do we do this? And part of it was speaking with a lot of friends who are very familiar with patents that are all fellow entrepreneurs that have experience and, oh, I, okay, I don't actually need to hire a lawyer for the provisional. I ended up doing that because I wanted to be uh, careful. But often as I'm learning with this, what I'll do is if I think it's a really great idea that can make money, even if it's down the road, I'll usually try to at least get the idea out or have it put on our site. And then the next stage would be filing the provisional, whether we write it in-house or hire somebody to do that. And then of course, I think that the key is when you get the provisional out, you've got a year to test it. So you should be ready to go to production at that point is my thought. 
because you have a year to really test it uh, on the mass market level and see is it working, is it not, before then going, you know, to the next stage. But, you know, I had to learn so much about this because let's say you do the provisional and you think, okay, great, I have a year. Well, what happens if while you're selling within that year, you start getting really valuable feedback from your retailers. You know what? I want you to tweak this. I want you to tweak that. It would sell more if you could do this. Actually, the market's changed. So this is all great. And we have sales coming in. But now that provisional doesn't really mean much because we have to redo the provisional. We can't just take that to the patent, you know? So it's it's, yeah. uh, it's a slippery slope. Well, there's a couple of ways to manage that. One way is if you do a claim with your provisional, a broad enough claim, it may cover everything you do along the way. Right. But it would take an, a patent attorney to figure that out for you. So what we advise clients, first of all, you're right that you want to actually patent what you're selling. So you could go with an invention to your manufacturing plant because we had this happen to a client early on and they could say, look, we can't make it the way you have it. You have to revise it. So then they have to revise it. And they had it that two or three times. And what we did was provisionals all along the way. So they did the first provisional and then we did another provisional six months later. Then we did another provisional two months after that. Right. And then we finally did the actual utility patent, which is the one that the patent office looks at which has to be done within a year of filing your provisional. So there's a couple of different ways to do it, but you're right. You want to make sure that you're patenting what you're selling. And there's a lot of changes. You have to figure out how to cover that. One thing that I heard that I was a bit surprised about is that um, most patents get rejected the first time. So after that first rejection, which happens all the time, you have to go back and argue with the patent office. And that's where they're lawyers, so you really need an attorney to do that because they understand each other. With Richard and the people at the law firm, they talk to these people called examiners all the time. So they know each other and they know what these people are expecting. We have a pretty high success rate for getting the patent applications through to the final patent, but but you're right. It is a shock and people are like, what? Right. <laughs> and they sometimes cite ridiculous things because they look at what's already in the literature and what patents have already issued. And you might have like a I don't know, support stand for something and they'll cite a paper cup and you're like, what? You know, you can have the best idea in the world and something everybody wants, but if you don't have the marketing, you're going to fall flat on your face. And the trademark is part of that too, which is something that we do too. So marketing is huge. Protecting your intellectual property is huge. And then all the rest of the infrastructure. So how many things have you invented and taken to market? Probably about six. And what have you been your biggest challenges with that? One of the first big ones was the Equisafe blanket, which is I'm an equestrian and my horse was affected by the California fires um, a few years back. And luckily he was fine, but I was out of town and I called the stables and I said, what, what's going on? Or, you know, I, I heard the fires are coming or the horse is evacuated. And I was shocked because they'd said, well, the, the stables are close to catching on fire and the fire department's actually here but they won't allow the evacuation trailers in because it's standard to block the roads from any commercial vehicles coming in because it could say the commercial vehicle breaks down, then regular traffic is blocked. So they're not letting the evacuation trailers in, which means the horses are stuck. And the fire department is literally saying, uh, set the horses loose or hose them down so they burn slower. And knock on wood, everything was okay. But I'm sure again, you know, everyone saw the news when the California fires hit uh, two years ago and horses were being set loose because there was no choice. And so that's sometimes what happens, which people don't understand. So the Eureka moment went off in my head. I wasn't thinking dollar signs at all. That product was literally, somebody needs to create this and mm -hmm. I know how to do it. And that product was uh, complicated from beginning to end for so many reasons. It was complicated because I wanted to make it affordable. I wanted to make it environmentally friendly, safe to humans, safe for the horses. So I had to think of every possible scenario that could go wrong. What if the horse is running and he gets caught on something? Okay, we need to make the back straps completely safe and um, you know quick release. And then teaching the factories something brand new that they didn't know. And I was so detail specific. I wanted to make sure that the thread was fire retardant, that the reflective strips were fire retardant. Then we had to do the GPS factor. The GPS needed to be forged, so learning all of that. So that one was really tough because it was all of the composition making it affordable and then convincing 
a world that's a little bit more conservative to adopt something new. So in order to actually get the accounts, I, I went to the best ones because I felt that there was an urgency to get this to market. And I flew into the account myself. I didn't want to put it in the hands of a salesperson because this was my baby. And they said, you know, we love the idea. We're not taking on any new clients. And I said, no problem. I brought a blowtorch. Do you want to see me blowtorch the blanket over my arm? And they were like, hang on, we're grabbing our sales manager. Let's go outside for this. So um, all of them have been a little bit challenging because when you're first to market, even if it's the best idea since sliced bread, you have some convincing to do. You do. And that can be the tough part. And entrepreneurs just have to keep going though, right? Because eventually it will catch on. Listeners, if you're just tuning in, the podcast comes out tomorrow. You have to hear Dahlia because wow, this lady is amazing. And stay tuned for the other people that are coming up on the show. You are listening to Passage to Profit, The Inventor Show with Richard Elizabeth Gearhart and Kenya Gibson filling in for Richard today and our special guest, Dahlia McPhee. And we'll be right back. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearhart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearhart Law has years Years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. With Elizabeth Gearhart and Kenya Gibson as your host today. And Kenya, you're going to introduce our next guest. Yes, yeah, so for our executive spotlight today, we have Gabriella. Uh, Santanello, I hope I got that right. And Gabriella yes. is the CEO and founder of A Line Partners. Gabriella, welcome to Passage to Profit. Thank you for having me. Tell us all about A Line Partners. A Line Partners is a retail research firm, and we conduct on the ground research. So I have a team of people in the malls across the country in 10 different markets. And they are gathering data. The data we gather is mostly on publicly traded companies. And then I provide my research to institutional investors. So hedge funds, mutual funds, and they use that as part of their investment process. So typically they have the numbers down. We call it the mosaic theory. So they take data from all different data sources and they use that to decide whether or not they're going to invest in a stock. It sounds like you're gathering some really important information. It's important at the end of the day, but when you're actually doing it, it's down to just really understanding the stores, the product, the promotional activity, just the positioning of the retailer, the consumer, and you roll that up. And then that's what the investors use to take a look at the companies and decide to invest or not. So Gabriella, when did you start this company? A-Line started about six years ago. Prior to that, I was at a stock brokerage firm for about six years as well, um, doing something very similar. And then prior to that, I was in the industry. So I started out in the fashion industry and I was primarily in wholesale sales and distribution. And I was a sales rep for a company called Notori that did sleepwear. And then I was at Mossimo before, well before they were in Target (laughs) when they were in department stores. And then moved on to companies like Nautica Jeans Company and then uh, Ralph Lauren Children's Wear. And I would primarily manage department stores and then also the Pacific Rim where I did some product development. And so what gave you the idea to start this? It happened, it was a little bit by luck. Um, I had some friends who were in finance and they would always call me and ask me what was going on in the industry and just try to get my my insights. And then I was at Ralph Lauren and I had a little bit of a break. I I was based in San Francisco at the time. I moved down to Southern California. A friend of mine worked at a bank and he kept asking me questions. And then finally he said, you know, I gave, I gave my boss your phone number. So they called me in, it was going to be a consulting job. And then they said, no, we'd like you to come on full time. So it was quite a 
change for me. And I have to say rather humbling because it was going from being in the fashion industry and then all of a sudden you're in finance and I had to get my licenses. So I had to prepare for the series seven, the series 86 and the series 87 to become a research analyst so that I could actually talk to investors. Until then I had not had major failures in my life, but those tests were really trying and I'm not going to lie, I failed a couple of times. It was quite humbling, but you know, it was actually fantastic and just a valuable experience. And I was really lucky because the stock brokerage firm was very entrepreneurial and they really supported me in what I was doing and it took off from there. And that's how I was able to transition into doing what I'm doing now. So how have things changed in your line of work since the mm-hmm. pandemic or have they not? Oh, they've changed a lot. Prior to the pandemic, you know, my team, we would go out to the malls and we were looking at stores like all mall-based retailers. So we were at Lululemon and Anthropology, and I was covering what they call soft lines. And when all the malls closed, it was, you know, I was like, what am I going to do? And all the women who work for me, we're, we're a team of women. They all said after about a week, I'm absolutely going crazy homeschooling my kids. Please let me go out. And I was like, okay, let's look at what's open. Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever was open. We were being as safe as we could. There was a one week there where we didn't go out, but I started reporting on companies that were an entirely different profile from what I had been covering. And my clients loved it. And it actually opened new doors for me because you have certain teams that, you know, hedge funds and mutual funds that, that cover what they call soft lines, which are, is everything really in the mall. And then you have entirely different teams that are covering these stores that are off mall and they call them broad lines. So it was great actually. And um, I was really nervous about it and we did the pivot and it ended up working. Thank goodness. You started with some industry knowledge, but pretty much from ground zero and built this business yourself. What do you think was the most important factor? What helped you be successful? When I was at the stock brokerage firm and really starting this, the one thing I did love about this company, it's called Wedbush Securities in Los Angeles, was there were a lot of women in management positions. And I remember one time the head of sales like pulled me over and she said, you know, you need to just go with your gut, like trust your intuition. If you have a feeling of something, you know, we want conviction. That's what everybody's looking for. And so I really tried to just practice that. So if I, you know, went into a store, I had a feeling about something, I just had to go with my gut, obviously supported by data and my past experiences, but really go with it and have conviction. And that really just taught me to persevere And one, I ended up building a really nice following. And one day I was at a trade show with a client and he just turned to me and said, you know, if you want to go out on your own, I'll support you. You could do this in a subscription service and, and it would be great for you. And one thing about finance in Los Angeles is you have to wake up at three in the morning. And so, and you have to be in the office by four. So the idea of being able to, you know, get up at maybe five thirty, six o'clock was very appealing. So I set a plan within a year, I was going to branch out on my own. And, um, and I did, you know, I look back on it and it was a sort of a bit of a leap of faith and I took some clients with me and it was a little nerve wracking, but you know, it ended up working out. So would you say it was your deep industry knowledge that really helped you succeed then? I would say that helped. Yes. So how does someone come to work with you? Like, how are you acquiring clients and what's a good client for you? My clients are the investors. I'm affiliated with a firm that deals with, I'm I'm considered an independent research provider. They hold my licenses. I also help hire them to do my sales and marketing. So they're the ones who go out and approach the clients for me. When I initially launched, it was all the people I knew who ended up launching with me and really giving me that support, which was great. But obviously you need to take it to the next level, which is why I ended up with this company called IRC Securities. And then for the people in the field, it's been... Craigslist, referrals, a site called The Every Girl, where I would just post that this is a retail specialist job. And I have a lot of great people who everybody has retail experience and they love going to the mall. Yeah. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of this segment. And if you missed any of this, the podcast is coming out tomorrow. But Kenya has a segment called Power Move. So interestingly enough, you had Effie had mentioned Jack Daniels. And we're going to be talking about a women entrepreneur by the name of of Fawn Weaver. She is the CEO of Uncle Nearest. So if you never heard of Uncle Nearest, she based the company, it's a whiskey company that she created 
based on the story of Nathan Nearest Green. He was an enslaved black man who actually taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. So there's a great backstory that's there. She did a lot of research and really just found that there was a great story there and there was a great market and there was not a lot of women who have tapped into the whiskey market. So we're working on getting her up here to Passage to Profit in the future, but She's got an amazing story. You know, she started this whiskey company not too long ago, probably back in 2016. It's grown leaps and bounds. She did all the necessary research to start it. She went out to Lynchburg, Tennessee, where the Jack Daniels is made and did a lot of research similar to what Gabriella does for a lot of her investors and just really found her niche in the market and created a really powerful brand story based on the history of this gentleman. So she's featured in Forbes. Her name is Fawn Weaver. And she is our highlight on Power Move today. Wow, what a great story to go with her product and what a great way to brand it. And there's always room for another whiskey. <laughs> That's true, especially now. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about Fireside. People who have listened to this show or know me know that almost a year ago now, I got the idea in October 2019 to start a video directory of, I was going to start with lawyers and I expanded it to small businesses once COVID hit. So what I do for Fireside is I interview business owners, such as you guys, and I ask you questions about your business and a little bit about yourself, if you want to say a little bit about yourself. And I tell people, really on video, you have 10 seconds. So people say the 30 second pitch, that's kind of gone in this day and age. You have 10 seconds to wow me. So say something really cool. So what I have decided to say about Fireside is, do you want to be a part of history while being a part of the future too? So this is the first and only one of its kind online video directory for small businesses. And the interviews I do really help you dig into your story. Like to Kenya's point, I love to get people's stories there because if somebody's figuring they want to hire a professional to help them, like a business coach or something, they want to know them a little bit. People that are product oriented, I encourage them to show their product, how they're using it on the video and everything. And I've been building it and COVID has actually helped a little bit because everybody's on Zoom now and people aren't afraid to talk to me on Zoom and have me recorded. It's like they barely even know it's being recorded. So I'm still in the building phase. So anybody that wants to put their business on Fireside, it's fireside.directory. It's not no.com. And I have the Fireside Directory YouTube channel too. And it's a really brilliant idea. I think people really want to get to know somebody that they want to work with or they want to hire. So I love the video component because it really gives you an opportunity to hear from the person, get their story and really evaluate if they're a right fit for you. So it's a really interactive experience that allows you to pick the right person. Yeah, so anybody that wants to be on it, I want it to be the Wikipedia of small business on video. I want it to be everybody's. And I have one person from England, from London on there already. So you're international now. <laughs> so with that, we have to go to our next break. But when we come back, we will be talking to Effie and then Stacy, And they both have really great stories to tell. And if you're just tuning in, we've heard two incredible stories from people that have started businesses and been very successful and a little bit about how they did it. So you can hear them on our podcast podcast tomorrow. Passage to Profit, The Inventor Show, Elizabeth Gearhart and Kenya Gibson today on WOR 710, The Voice of New York. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearhartLaw.com. At Gearhart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T 
A-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We have just spoken to two fascinating women who are just knocking it out of the ballpark with their companies. And now <laughs> we have someone coming up who made something near and dear to my heart. <laughs> anyway, her name is Effie Panagopoulos, and I'm going to let her talk about her product. Welcome, Effie. Thanks for having me. Uh, Effie Panagopoulos, I'm the first Greek woman in history to start a liquor brand. I also work with Greece's first female distiller and uh, the product I make is called Cleos Mastica Spirit. Cleos is a Greek liqueur made from an ancient Greek superfood called Mastica. Mastica is a resin that comes from a tree that grows only on one island in the entire planet. That's the island of Chios. Um, so it's what you would call a PDO. It's a protected designation of origin ingredient protected by the EU. In fact, They've tried to plant trees on the northern part of the island. The trees grow, but they don't produce the same aromatic sap. And this sap is a superfood. It kills H. pylori, which is the bacteria that causes peptic ulcers, gastric cancer, acid reflux. It's antibacterial, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. Healing properties for the stomach are retained in liquor form. By no means am I, you know, selling this as a health product. It is alcohol at the end of the day, but very much an extension of a healthy lifestyle. Besides all the health benefits of mastica, more importantly, it as an ingredient in this spirit that I make, it's absolutely delicious and it's fabulous in cocktails. It's been called bartender's olive oil by the press because it's so versatile. It literally mixes one to one with every base spirit on the back bar. But then it kind of does that double duty where you can drink it by itself. So I kind of say it's, you know, bartender's olive oil meets a very exotic alternative to a vodka or a gin. And the bottle's beautiful. Thank you. Took me a very long time to produce and source this packaging. And it is the bane of my existence. I'm moving production again to Europe because I've had some really bad experiences with the supply chain in China. You know, the fun stuff of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Where can people buy it? Yeah, that was my first question. <laughs> like, I need to try it right away. You know, real easy, just on my website, drinkcleos.com, there's a where to buy link and you can see most of the stores. I have one retailer that ships to 12 states and I'm actively selling in New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and then Florida as well. So this year I'm looking to open up California officially, although I do ship to California online, but I'm looking to open up California, Illinois, and Florida wide, as well as DC, Maryland. Well, I'm going to buy a bottle for Richard for his birthday in November because he likes trying these these new tastes. What does it taste like? Do you have any comparisons? Yeah. So when I did um, blind tastings with consumers and with American consumers, uh, the most common tasting note that came back was actually cucumber. Cucumber, sweet tea comes up quite often. People will sometimes think it's like a sweeter gin. And then cocktail bartenders very often say carrots. And I know this sounds completely bizarre. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's both vegetal and earthy and minerally, but then a touch sweet. So it's been compared, you know, by kind of like sommeliers, you know, these very nerdy palates said root vegetables quite often, celery, dill, aloe. It's really very complex and very layered. And that's what's also so cool about it. why did you start this company? What was your inspiration? Quite a Sisyphean journey. Been in the liquor industry for almost 20 years. I worked for Bacardi, for Remy. I consulted for tons of startup brands, but I was the national brand ambassador for Metaxa, which is a Greek brandy. That job brought me back to Greece. I was in Mykonos in 2008. Everyone around me was doing shots of Mastika, and this was to American tourists, not Greeks. And I tasted it and... I thought to myself, oh my God, this is delicious. Why don't we have this yet in the United States? And I grew up with mastica as a spoon dessert. So they take mastica, mash it up with a bunch of sugar and glycerin, and it looks like fluff. So it's the stuff you swirl around in water and suck on it like a lollipop. So I knew the flavor. So like I said, once you know that flavor, I was like, wait a minute, I know this. This is like what I had with my grandmother in the village. And I'm like, they make alcohol from this. And so 
that was kind of my eureka moment. And as I'm sure many of the women can appreciate here, you know, I dealt with a lot of nonsense being a female starting a product in a very male dominated industry. I started off consulting for an existing brand out of Greece. It was obviously owned by a man. Um, I helped him get importation and distribution in the United States. And then he did not pay my consulting fee and then thought I would work for him for a $3,000 a month paltry retainer with no equity. And I kind of was like, no way in hell am I going to build this brand for somebody for peanuts. And then on top of it, I really wanted to kind of improve upon the category. So like they have very nondescript packaging. The liquid was excessively sweet, not particularly refined and sophisticated. So I really also wanted to kind of create the super premium, the luxury Mastika brand to be the brand that's going to be on every back bar. There was a brand called St. Germain that launched in 2007 in New York and it lit up like wildfire. I'm sure some of the ladies know this brand. It's an elderflower liqueur. It opened up a whole new world of cocktail opportunities, very light, very floral, but it's not the type of thing you would drink by itself. So when I tasted Mastika for the first time, and by the way, that brand sold to Bacardi for 150 million after about six years. So when I tasted Mastika for the first time, I thought to myself like, well, this could be the next St. Germain and I want to be the one to make this happen. Is it on the back bar at Milos in New York City? It is indeed, yes. Oh, wow. That, okay, I'm so excited. That's my favorite restaurant. It's also on the menu at Dante, which is rated the number one bar in the world's 50 best bars list. The Dante Martini has Cleos in it with gin and vermouth. I'm interested in, in how, you know, throughout the years, like you built relationships and when you decided to go out on your own, did you tap into any of those relationships or how did you get funding or sort of, you know, did you bootstrap it? What was your strategy? I consulted for tons of startup brands. And in the past, it's like, you get these brands where I'm kind of like, who gave you money and why are you doing this? <laughs> Again, I'm going to be confidently humble. Whereas in my case, like I've got a stellar, beautiful product but I'm not bankrolled or anything, right? So I started off doing a friends and family and literally just put together a list of anyone I knew who might have money or was connected to somebody with money. And I kind of started like that. Wow. But in terms of, you know, relationships, that's the strength, you know, that I bring to the proposition is I've been in the industry for 20 years a lot of people are like, oh, well, what, what about your distribution? I'm like, I got that. I don't need help on distribution. I already pretty much have a strong idea of who I want to hire in all my key markets. I just need the capital. So I've raised about 500,000 in friends and family, not all at once. And pre-COVID, I tried to kick off a $2 million raise and then had to stop. And now I'm just kind of raising like a $200,000 bridge just to get through COVID because the VCs are really sharky right now. So I don't want to raise yeah. it down round. Kind of just get through it and then go from there and raise the big dollars. I am excited about this. Drinkcleos.com. And that's also the Instagram. Everybody listening or listening to the podcast, keep your eye on these women because <laughs> they are the Warren Buffetts of the next decade or soon, I hope. Stay tuned because because this next presenter has something very important for you to know about, really, especially in this time of COVID, particularly. So listen for the podcast tomorrow if you want to rehear any of this. Look for us on YouTube if you want to see what we look like. It's really been a fun show, but I am so excited for Stacy right after this break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the Inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years. Hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world. QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me. Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. 
Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome back, everybody, to Passage to Profit. I am Kenya Gibson. Super honored to be here filling in for Richard Gearhart today, along with Elizabeth, my lovely co-host. And I'm really pleased to bring on our next presenter. Her name is Stacy Kirk. And her platform or product is Posture. I- yeah, sure. So Posture is a cybersecurity and compliance program as a service. We have a platform that solves a business critical need for small and mid-sized businesses, which is to be secure and compliant, but to do so quickly and affordably. Our mission is to help these small and mid-sized businesses really thrive and have impact. But in this day and age, that definitely requires an organization to have cyber resiliency and also compliance as their competitive advantage. And we found that there really is no shortage of cybersecurity tools out there, um, as well as high price consultants, but they really don't have what they need to get it done because as a small business, you're wearing 400 hats to try to make your business grow. And so our platform brings together expert advice, advisory, training, policy generation, and it's all wrapped in our proprietary methodology that reduces the time that it takes to become compliant from what would normally take one year down to a month and what would normally cost to $20,000 down to two. Excellent. And you do HIPAA compliance. Yeah. And so uh, part of the challenges that we've seen this year with COVID is that cybersecurity is even more important in, for healthcare organizations. Since the COVID started, there has been um, nearly a uh, doubling of the attacks against uh, healthcare organizations. And so we wanted to make sure that as we launched, we really focused first on the compliance that had not only some of the harshest regulations or the most difficult regulations, but also served a very pressing need, not only for healthcare providers, but for all the companies that work, businesses associates, um, health tech that work with organizations. And so uh, we offer HIPAA compliance and we really walk them through not only getting the policies generated very quickly, but um, the training that you need for every person that works within your organization. And we do so in, I think, a very cool way with very short anime videos that are interesting and relevant and a learning management system that keeps everything organized. I'm a small business owner even before I start a posture. And I've got to tell you, just being able to say it's happening and I don't have to worry about it or remind people or track evidence is just been so valuable for our clients so far. What size organizations do you work with? This is not my first company. As I mentioned, I have a tech consulting firm that does custom software development and testing and digital transformation. And so what we do there is we work with small businesses all the way to Fortune 500, Fortune 100. But what has become our passion is really the small and mid-sized business space. Because as I talk with them about their challenges, each one of them would say to me, what can you do to help me with security? We need help. We're drowning here. There's actually 4 million unfilled jobs in cybersecurity. And a lot of people think about software development and they think about tech jobs, but cybersecurity globally is very hard to fill. And even if you do hire people, you're hiring people that still need help because they're pretty new one or two years out. And so working with the companies that are employees of, just to kind of answer your question, employees of one, which is kind of like a solo entrepreneur, up to 500 really struggle. They can't attract the top talent often from in cybersecurity, and they don't necessarily have a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars to invest in building out a cyber resilient program. Yeah, and it must be a very complex space because you say cybersecurity, and I'm like, I know what that means, but I don't, to be honest with you. You know, so I'm sure that you can help people understand the importance of it and why it's so critical to their business. Yeah, I mean, some of the numbers are pretty scary. 50% of small and mid-sized businesses um, said that they've been attacked in the last year. And if a small, mid-sized business is attacked, there's a 60% chance that they're not going to last more than six months. And at the same time, every time we experience a data or privacy problem, 
they create a new regulation. Um, and in the last 10 years, there's been a 270% increase in the number of regulations. And as a small business owner, even with my um, background, 20 year background in technology, I still would think of cybersecurity and go, hmm? What do I do? And what was, I think, the scariest is that a few years ago, my company was attacked. And in just a split second as an entrepreneur, I was like, oh my gosh, everything that I've built, all those sleepless nights and all of that hard work could be gone. And I was fortunate. I, we had monitoring in place and it alerted us right away. But even in those few hours, there were thousands of dollars in charges that we incurred. Um, and luckily we were able to explain it away with uh, AWS and get everything resolved. But imagine if we didn't have that in place and imagine if we didn't know what to do and how to handle it. And so really building this company, it's really important that we give kind of a level playing field for small and mid-sized businesses to really have a competitive advantage. A lot of Fortune 500, they don't want to work with businesses that don't have a cybersecurity program. It's too much of a risk. You hear about all of these large corporations that are getting breached, and often that has to do with third-party vendors. And so we want to be able to say, it's okay. You don't have to know anything about cybersecurity. Come to us. We have the advisory portion of it. Um, we're not just a tool because clearly you can't just give someone a tool and they figure it out. And that's kind of what we learned in our couple of years of trials and betas to figure out. You really need an advisor, someone that you can call and be like, what does ransomware mean? It's all over my screen. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for keeping us all safe. <laughs> <laughs> Does this include protection on, you know, all the mobile devices as well? Well, we start with the organization first. People sometimes say, okay, well, which servers are you protecting or what devices are you protecting? The majority of breaches happen because of some type of human intervention. And so we start at the base. We start with making sure your organization has the policies in place. It has the training in place okay. to make good decisions and build cyber hygiene so that it's an ongoing culture that you're creating. And then from there, we have this incredible marketplace. We don't wanna create it all. It's just, there's so many good tools out there that we create a marketplace so that you can say, hey, my entire company is on mobile devices. What can you recommend for us for a mobile device? Okay. And so we have those partnerships. And we also go out to partners that are within the price range that we think small, medium businesses can afford. Because there's some products that are you know, $100,000. And that's just not reasonable and feasible. So we, we make sure that the partnerships we make are feasible, quick, easy to integrate so that they can, as a small business, you don't have to worry about it. We can just help you deploy it and move on. I'm just wondering, like with the instances with like these small and medium sized companies and protecting them and like, what's the vulnerability with those companies? I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a very, very small business, but I'm just curious because I'm like, oh, you know, I, I kind of come up thinking like, oh, well, nobody's going to bother to attack me and sort of, so I'm just curious as to, you know, what the vulnerability is for some of these really small companies and like how small do you go? We have clients that are just one person, one person team. You'd be surprised. Half of the attacks, at least in the United States, are against small and mid-sized businesses. Hackers look for opportunity. They know mm -hmm. that small, mid-sized businesses don't have, you know, the firewalls set up. They know yeah. that they don't all have antivirus on every device. And so they use that as leverage to attack. And so what is proven to be the strongest way to fight against this and be resilient is really through training. Um, mm -hmm. and having policies. And it's very surprising. I mean, you hear about, you know, these ransomware attacks, a lot of those come through phishing. Yeah. You're reading an email and I, this happens yeah. uh, even at my company, it happens every two months, someone uses my name and they send an email to my staff and it says, I need you to get on this urgently and mm. click on this link and go for it. And if it wasn't for the training my team has, and they send it to me like, Stacey, uh, this isn't you, right? But imagine if your team wasn't continually being reminded of these type of attacks. 90% of home remote workers now are not secure. You know, we all moved remotely. 
um, or online, but we don't have a security officer at our house to tell us, hey, you need to yeah. change your firewall password or your Wi-Fi password. A lot of our young children, including mine, think it's okay to jump on my computer and download a video, <laughs> a video game or something like that. So all of that is part of the training that we provide just so people are aware of what they have to do, even if it's just one person in the company. That needs to be part of an entrepreneurial startup okay. packet yeah. or something so that everybody knows that it doesn't matter what size you are, that you're vulnerable to attacks. Are you just the type of person that their brain goes to tech and it's easy for you? Like, how did you get into tech? I've always been wired to enjoy computers, like from the age of seven, I asked my parents to buy me a Commodore 64 so I could write my name Stacy and say, <laughs> run Stacy and just watch my name just go across the screen. So I've been a nerd for a very long time. I did study computer science and I wanted a industry field and we've got women here. So I'll just say, I wanted something where I knew I would always have a job that people wouldn't fire me. Not that I'm not a good employee, but they wouldn't fire me over silly stuff. If someone, you know, mistreated me, I could say, you're losing out. I know I'm in demand. Bye. See you later. So I think there was a couple reasons why I enjoyed tech, but definitely I enjoy problem solving and it doesn't always have to be technology. And that's kind of where posture is trying to get it right. We're not just saying, Hey, here's a tool, just log in and all your cybersecurity issues are go away. It really, we are humans. We have to take that part and remember that humans make mistakes and they need conversation and they need understanding. So I enjoy bringing those two worlds together. Excellent. And what's your website? Our website is postured with a D dot IO. So thank Think of good posture, cyber hygiene, <laughs> posture, <laughs> posture, posture D.io. With that, we have to go to another break, but we're going to come back for a quick wrap up. And if you're just tuning into the radio, WOR 710, where this show plays, you can catch the podcast tomorrow. I think this has been a fantastic show, a lot of variety, but a lot of very cool stuff and very innovative and inventive things going on. And we will be right back after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. With Elizabeth Gearhart and our special co-host today, Kenya Gibson. And if you want to reach Kenya, it's Kenya Gibson with a P at iHeartMedia.com. iHeartMedia has excellent advertising possibilities, radio, digital media, everything. And Kenya is the person to talk to about that. And then we had Dahlia McPhee, a serial entrepreneur, a success in the fashion world. Thanks again. And as far as checking us out, you can simply go to the website, which is D-A-L-I-A McPhee, M-A-C-P-H-E-E.com. And then we had Gabriella. So Gabriella, do you want to tell us your website and any thoughts on the show? Sure. So my website is alinepartners.com. And just as far as just all the entrepreneurs out there, I mean, I think you've got to, you know, build your experience and then just don't be afraid to take the leap. I mean, I think if you're well prepared, just have to be willing to take the chance. Excellent. So Effie, your website and your product and how people can find you. Drinkcleos.com. So D-R-I-N-K-K-L-E-O-S. Um, the Instagram is the same. It's at Drinkcleos. I pretty much answer most of those messages. You can communicate with me directly there. And again, if you go to the website, there's a where to buy link um, shipping to 16 states now. Cleos Mastica Spirit. It's a Greek liqueur made from a superfood called Mastica. 
And Stacy, You can find us at postured.io, P-O-S-T-U-R-E-D.io. Um, you can follow us on all social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram at postured up. And uh, words of wisdom is, uh, it doesn't matter how small you are. It's always important to make sure you understand the basics of cybersecurity. That's not through us. There's definitely a wealth of information online. So take the time to learn it. Excellent. Kenya, final thought. Yeah, I just was, you know, excited to be a part of this today. Got to talk about some of my favorite things, fashion, cocktails, um, and got to learn a whole lot too, just about data and, and the importance of cybersecurity. You can find Passage to Profit on social media. We'd really love it if people would subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're trying to build that up. And it is Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on YouTube, but we're also on Facebook and Instagram at Passage to Profit Show and on Twitter at Passage to Profit. And our podcast, of course, is on iHeart, is Passage to Profit. We will see you next week for another great show. Keep listening.